Hi everyone, welcome to Parkside at Home. And no matter where you're watching from, we are so excited that you've chosen to join us for the next 20 minutes or so. Our desire is to see as many people as possible feel connected and experience the life-transforming message of Jesus. So if you've been impacted by your experience, why not take a moment to share the link on whatever platform you're watching on right now. This will help us spread the news of the amazing bridge building community and invite others to be a part of it. Everything we do at Parkside and in our community is because of your generosity. Why not consider becoming one of our giving partners? To do this, the easiest way is to simply go to our website at parkside.life slash give. Follow the prompts on your screen and you can give a one-time gift or set up a reoccurring gift. By doing this, we partner together to build bridges between people and Jesus. Today, I want to encourage you with two things, connecting to God and connecting to others. Why not spend some time getting to know a God who loves you and listens to you and wants to lead you and connect with others? We need each other. We need to be supportive and encouraging to one another. We wanna invite you to connect one time a month or more if you can and have set up different ways that you can do that by engaging at Parkside at Home, just like you're doing right now with people in your home, or maybe you wanna consider inviting a few friends over and having a watch party together and sharing the experience, or joining a band. These small groups make sure that every person is given the tools and relationships they need to have a solid grasp on what God's word says. The word of God is an essential part of our bridge building story. You can get more information and sign up on our website at parkside.life bands or join us at 113 Minus Street for a live experience on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. The important thing is for us to connect to God and connect to others. So the easiest way for you to figure out what is my next step is simply visiting parkside.life slash next steps for more details. So with that being said, the moment you've been waiting for is here. Our experience is about to begin and it all starts right now. Hey guys, thanks again for joining us here at Parkside at Home. Uh, I just wanna reiterate how excited we are that you will be joining us here today just to hear a little bit about God's Word and, and dive in with us. So uh, as you know, we started off the year uh, talking about how we can make a great comeback and start off the year on a really strong foot. So we're gonna continue that today and, and we're just gonna take a look at a passage of scripture that I believe really can impact us as disciples in Christ and give us an idea of how we can live that godly life that God has called us to and that Jesus modeled for us. So if you have your Bibles with you, or if you have your, your Bible app on your phone, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 26. Uh, so while you're getting there, just to give you a little bit of background, what's just happened is Jesus has called the disciples and he has selected the 12 apostles from them. So he took this group of guys that he said, hey, you know what? I have a better way for you. Come follow me. And he's now selected the 12, and they're headed back down in to do some incredible ministry. So Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 17. He, being Jesus, went down with them, being the disciples and the apostles that he just chose, and stood on a level place. 
A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Now, up front, that does not sound like a very encouraging passage, right? It's talking about being poor and weeping and hungry and rejected, and there's lots of woes in there. But I, I want us to take a minute and really break this passage down, okay? So we're going to start right up at the top, and we're just going to move through it together and see what it is that God has for us today and, and just some things that we can take out of the text. Uh, just a quick note when you're reading your Bible, right? A couple of things that we always want to do. We want to make sure that we're looking at Scripture as a whole, all right, so looking at the whole thing front to back and everything that God has to say for us, we want to look at it in context, meaning we want to make sure we're taking a look at like what's going on around the story that we're reading, who are the people that we're dealing with, uh, maybe where is it happening, the location, uh, what kind of story are we dealing with, and we always want to read it in community. Always, always, always be reading it in community so that we can discuss these things that, that God has for us, the scriptures that he's given us, and we can refine each other. We can grow together in our knowledge and understanding of God's word. So starting right up at the top, uh, it says in verse 17 that Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. Now, I want us to just stop there for a second. Jesus takes the disciples and goes with them. Jesus absolutely could have gone by himself down to these people and, and started healing and doing incredible ministry, but he brought people alongside him to do the ministry that God had called him to do. So we as disciples, right, if we're looking at Jesus as the model of how we're supposed to live our lives and, and really live out what God has asked us to do, we need to make sure you're doing it with others. Remember, in community. So he went down with them and stood on a level place. And all of these people are coming around to hear him, to be healed, to experience what it is that Jesus has to offer them. Uh, it says they were troubled by impure spirits and they were cured and all the people tried to touch him because power, notice, was coming from him and healing them all. So not only is Jesus doing this ministry with the disciples, the people that he had just called out, that he said, hey guys, come along with me, let's do this together. It's costing him something. The power is going out from him. So first couple of things I want us to think about is the fact that we need to be disciples in community. We need to disciple with others, do ministry with others, be in the Christian life with others. And to be honest, it's going to cost us something. When we're really diving into the life that God has called us to, it does not come free. You know, Jesus paid the ultimate price for us on the cross by dying and, and removing the sin that we have so, struggled with for so long and the things that have separated us from God. He paid that price. But guys, just because he paid the ultimate price, right, does not mean that our life in him should be free. It's going to cost us something and it's going to be difficult. It's going to require something of us. And, and using that and kind of keeping that in mind, let's take a look now at all of these blessed and woes that he's been talking about. So he mentions that, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed who hunger, blessed who weep, and blessed are you when people hate you and reject you. And we should rejoice in that. That word blessed... Now, it's not like, you know, hashtag blessed we have today. It's a little bit different. It's deeper than that. It's an understanding and a knowledge of the fact that God is directing and guiding everything that we do as believers. It's a deep satisfaction and understanding of God's sovereignty and his providence in our life. Now, when we're blessed and we have that understanding and we know that God is with us and for us no matter what, man, that is an incredible thing. 
it fills us with this joy and can give us this joy that is so complete and so full and so just just incredible that it is not dependent on, it is not contingent upon any kind of circumstances or events that are happening in our lives. It is dependent solely on God. And that's a good thing because God never changes. He is always for us and with us no matter what. So when we're living a blessed life, right, and we're actually truly blessed, like Jesus says here, blessed are you, you have this understanding and this knowledge that, man, God is with me and nothing's ever going to take that away. The book of Romans, Paul says that there is nothing that can suffer, separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he goes off and lists a whole bunch of different things. He says, no sickness, no height, no death, no angel, no demon, no, not even death itself can separate us from the love of God that we have in Jesus. That is what it means to be blessed. So let's look at this first phrase here. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus, when, when he gives this message, and we kind of hear this in other places, we, we hear about it in, in Matthew, right? Uh, we can understand and we look at co- the whole context and the whole of Scripture. I right? remember when we look at it as a whole, we can see that he's not necessarily talking about material goods here. Not materially poor, but spiritually poor. And this word poor that we have in the original language is a deep, deep poverty, like severe poverty, someone that is utterly helpless. So blessed are the poor, blessed are the utterly helpless, utterly spiritually helpless, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, that might sound strange, but the great thing about this is if we are completely, utterly helpless, that means we need to rely on somebody else for everything. We can rely on God for everything. When we recognize and realize our own spiritual poverty and the fact that we can do nothing apart from Christ and that we have no life outside of him, man, that's an incredible thing. And that is the building block. That is the the very beginning, the foundation of this faith that we can have in Christ. And it's, it's kind of interesting. I want to circle back just a little bit here in verse 20. Uh, he starts it off by saying, looking at his disciples, Luke does, He said, blessed are you who are poor. Jesus is addressing the disciples here. He's not talking to the people who haven't yet decided to follow him. He's addressing the disciples and says, disciples, look, blessed are you when you understand and recognize your spiritual poverty and your utter helplessness because then and only then is the kingdom of God yours. Charles Spurgeon said this, it's not what I have, but what I have not, that is the first point of contact between my soul and God. So guys, when we recognize and understand the fact that we are spiritually impoverished and we are poor and we come to realize that we need to rely on God for everything all the time, man, bless are we and he can fill us with a joy that is unparalleled and un changing. So, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, right? So we have to recognize and realize that we need to rely on God for everything. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Hunger, right? It's something that drives us to to eat, right? I I know I'm a guy, I'm often referred to as the garbage disposal by members of our team because I like to eat and it doesn't really matter what's in front of me. I'm probably going to eat it, right? Regardless of if it's very good. Do I like other things more than some? Sure, great. But I just like food, so I'm going to eat it, right? But this this hunger that Jesus is talking about is an an innate desire and a drive to, to be filled and to be fed. Guys, I know that you know somebody in your life that is trying to fill their life with things that, man, it's just leaving them empty at the end of it. No matter how much they're taking in, no matter how much they're consuming, whether it be drugs, alcohol, social media, relationships, it can be any kind of thing that we try to fill this God-sized hunger inside of us that's just going to leave us empty every single time. But man, blessed are we when we are hungry for you will be satisfied. Guys, if we know how we can be filled, and who it is that can fill us, man, we can be satisfied. Jesus tells us in in the book of John that he is the bread of life. 
He tells the woman at the well that he is living water, that if we eat and drink of him, right, metaphorically, that we will never hunger or thirst again. He is who can fill us. He is that only that one thing that truly can. God being in relationship with him satisfies our hunger. So when we are poor in spirit, and we recognize that we need God, we begin to rely on him and say, okay, God, man, help me out here. He can begin to fill us and we can begin to be transformed by the renewing of our minds to be like Jesus. So, blessed are you who are poor for years of the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hunger now for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now for you will laugh. Now, this one's kind of strange, okay? Uh, weeping is not necessarily a, a good thing or something that we enjoy doing. Uh, everybody's ugly cried at some point in their life, and it's just not fun, right? But this weeping comes from a place of brokenness, right? So when, when we recognize we are spiritually poor and we understand that Jesus is the only way we can have this hunger in us filled to be satisfied, man, the brokenness that Jesus is referencing in this weeping comes from a godly sorrow of understanding and knowing, man, there are people out there that don't understand the hope that I can have and that I do have in Jesus Christ. Guys, if we're not weeping for those around us, if we're not weeping, being broken as God is broken for us, for the lost, for those that don't have the hope that we have, for those that have never experienced the kind of love that God has shown us, that he has given us, man, we need to really, really, really look at ourselves and start praying, God, break me. Break me. Break my heart for the things that break your heart. Give me a heart for the lost. Give me a heart for those around me that don't know you. Guys, weeping is not necessarily a bad thing. It's something that we can take and we look, okay, God, you've given me this brokenness and I can feel this deeply inside of me and now I can act on it because, you know, Scripture says in the Psalms that there may be weeping in the night, but joy comes in the morning, right? We can be blessed in our weeping. That joy comes because God can feel it. You say, okay, yes, I understand this, but you know ultimately in the end, man, there's going to be wholeness again. No more brokenness because I have redeemed all things through my son, Jesus. So, we can be spiritually poor. We can be hungry. We can be weeping. And this last one is really pretty strange, right? Bless are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Guys, when we live differently, and we live boldly in the life that God has called us to, we are going to be persecuted. People don't like that. Satan doesn't like that. Evil doesn't like that. He'll even flip it around and say, man, us following God, we're the evil ones. We should be hated because darkness has no place being in the presence of light. It shrinks and shrivels away and it just it just hates it. It can't stand being in that and it's going to fight against it. Darkness does not like to lose ground to the light. So guys, when you are being hated, when you are being rejected, when you're being persecuted, when the world is saying there's something wrong with you because of the things that you believe and how dare you believe that? How dare you? You, you have no reason saying that I should live this way or, or God has a better way for me. You don't know any better. Guys, that's nothing new. Jesus said, man, don't worry. The world hated me first. They're going to hate you, and that's okay. We've become more concerned in the church with being liked by our neighbors than we are with loving our neighbors. Guys, we've flip-flopped it. That's not the gospel that God has called us to. That's not what Jesus modeled for us. He said, man, it's a good thing when you're hated. And as a matter of fact, if we look at Hebrews chapter 11, we have this hall of fame, so to speak, of individuals that have lived in faith. Uh, it goes all the way from Abraham to Moses to David to, to all kinds of these big faith leaders. That we look back in the Bible and we're like, man, they were incredible. 
But guys, they, most of them, didn't even get to see the thing that they were hoping for. They died beforehand. They just had faith and they knew that in the end, in the last days, that God was going to triumph and that God is sovereign and that God is good. And they were blessed because they had that unspeakable joy that filled them, that welled up inside them. They knew that no matter what, even if they didn't see things through to the end, or even if things didn't turn out how they thought it would, or even if they didn't ultimately get to see the thing that God had promised would happen, they knew that God was still going to follow through, that God was good, and that he was with them and for them, and that no matter what happened to them, God was never going to change, and he is in charge of eternity. Guys, that's an incredible thing. That's a hopeful thing. That's something that we can look at and, and we can say, oh my gosh, that, God, you've given me this, this wonderful gift and we never have to worry. So we can be poor, we can be hungry, we can be weeping, we can be hated and in the midst of all of that, be blessed. We can be blessed. We can live this life of infectious joy. Guys, there's a reason that people were constantly coming to Jesus despite everybody else hating on him. There was a reason why little kids loved to flock to him. There was something about him that was undeniable and inescapable, something that just drew people to him. And it wasn't just the miracles and the supernatural acts of God, okay? There was a spirit about him of joyfulness, of blessedness. It's not just he had all the cool stuff and all the right things and all the right clothes and all the cool friends. As a matter of fact, he didn't really have any of those things. He chose the opposites. But because he lived the blessed life and he recognized these things, oh man, what an incredible, incredible testimony to the work of God and the power of God and the Holy Spirit in your life and in his life. So when we look at these woes, like, man, woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are well fed. Woe to you who laugh now. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. It's not so much a threat as it is a regret. Woe to you, man, you missed it. You missed out. You were, you know, rich in this life and you found some other riches to fill yourself. You tried to find other things to, to make you well fed. You were laughing now. You, everyone speaks well of you. Man, you missed out on God's purpose and plan for your life. Now, does that mean that we can't, you know, have some good things and eat some good food and have a good time and all? Like, no, 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 not at all. Remember, we're talking in the spiritual sense here. When we don't recognize and realize that we have a deep need and a deep hole inside of our spirits that can only be filled by God, we've missed the mark. Now, something that all of these have in common, all these points, uh, being poor, hungry, weeping, hated, uh, it's all pretty uncomfortable. That's not something that we necessarily like to admit or experience. So this is really the only thing that I wanna encourage you guys with today to take from this, and that's this to get uncomfortable. Man, when we get uncomfortable, some amazing things can happen. If we're truly following God, we're not always going to be comfortable. It's not always going to be a comfortable experience. It's not always going to be something that's easy. It's not always going to be something that makes us look cool or is good for the gram, right? It's not always going to be something that we like doing. But man, when we step out in faith into the sea, like Peter, he stepped off the boat under the waters, didn't know it was going to happen. God showed up. And man, what an incredible, incredible, incredible story we have now of faithfulness. What an incredible story of faithfulness that we have. Abraham taking his only son up to say, God, you've asked me to do this, so I'm willing to give him up for you. And God redeems the situation. He saves his son. He gives him something new. Guys, nobody ever experienced the greatness of God and his supernatural movement in his life, the Holy Spirit indwelling them and pouring out into others while they remained comfortable. It just doesn't happen. Only when we take bold steps out in faith 
into the life that God has called us to and we recognize our poverty and we recognize our hunger and who can fill it and we begin to weep for those around us and then we say, man, I don't care what the world has to say. I'm going to follow the one true God and the big T truth that he has set in my life and that is the word of God and that is scripture and that is the life that he's called me to and the life that Jesus has modeled for me. When we say that's more important to me than anything else, anything else, God says literally anything else, then, then we can begin to experience the blessings, the wonder, the joy, the fullness, the satisfaction that comes from knowing that no matter what, God is with us and for us. And it all starts with us getting uncomfortable. So as we're closing out today, I just want you to think about a couple of things. Like, how uncomfortable have I gotten in my faith? How uncomfortable has it made me? Am I doing things that really only ever make me feel good or never make me step outside of my comfort zone? Or am I only ever doing things that are easy? Because guys, I'm going to be real with you. If when you're praying and you're asking God, man, what can I do and how can I follow you? If you're only ever hearing from God things for him or things for you to do that make you comfortable or that are easy or that are never making you step out in faith, you might need to reevaluate how you're listening to God. Ask others to pray in your life for you to take bold steps, for you to do big things, for God to reveal others around you that, man, you can be that light. You can be the one that shows them the poorness and the spirit that they have and how they can be filled and why their weeping can be turned to joy. It is an incredible thing to know and be known by God.